Well, howdy. Hey, we are live. Thank you very much. It is Wednesday, August 10th, and we have a lot to talk about today. So thank you for joining. If uh, you join live, that's great. Fantastic. Definitely my preference. If not, all good. Uh, join next time. We do these every Wednesday and Friday around noon Eastern Standard Time. I believe that's GMT minus five, something like that. Maybe GMT minus, is that right, Kathy? Yeah, GMT minus five. And thank you for the coffee, I appreciate that. So Wednesday and Friday, GMT minus five, noon Eastern Standard Time, approximately. It is noon right now, so I started exactly on time today, which is a, I regard as a big win for me. Very exciting. Uh, let's see. Well, today we're going to be talking about a few things. I'm going to be I'm going to be talking a bit about if you wanted to learn from video games, how well that would work, and how if the answer is it will work, how you might go about doing that. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some other things too. I have some cultural things planned as well. Um, I found a list of cultural norms, and I want to kind of go through them, American cultural norms, and talk about those. I have some questions from Reddit today, and of course, I'll be taking your questions. If you have questions about idioms, phrases, grammar, culture, pronunciation, whatever, feel free to ask. Uh, let's see. What else is there? Oh, yeah. Of course, if you, if you enjoy uh, these... Uh, these uh, English lessons that I do, I would really sincerely, deeply appreciate you hitting the like button. That helps a lot. And subscribing. Like button, subscribe. Like button, subscribe. Like button, subscribe. And um, if you want to, you can check out my courses. You can uh, just check the links. There's One of them is free, so you can get a free course. So try that out. See if you like my courses and then take it to the next level. There's a reason it's free. It's pretty short. Most of my courses are about 15 hours long. That one's one hour. But still, there's a lot of very useful content there, I believe. Check that out. Also doing a course sale. If you go to the link in the description, you can check out the Building Your English Brain course which looks something like this and you can sign up for the full price or if you click on this and put in the coupon code what the heck is the coupon code what the heck is the coupon code um brain food is the code kind of a long one brain food that will give you a significant discount on that course. So if you want to really invest in yourself and get started, that is the course that I recommend of mine people take first. Uh, why? I think it it focuses on the approach of learning rather than, you know, teaching this or teaching that. It's how. So once you know how, then what you learn, you're learning, you're getting the most out of learning, right? So uh, hard, hard Life says, cool with this hairstyle thank you this is just what happened when i woke up today so i'm happy about that happy you like it um i i don't spend a lot of time styling my hair but something weird did happen with a haircut my haircut today so i live in the hudson valley which is a pretty big region of new york state you know there are i don't know how many towns in the hudson valley maybe a hundred. And so I went to a dinner party type thing last Thursday. And I thought, well, I don't want to look like a, a doofus at the dinner party. So I'm going to get a haircut. So I went to the nearest haircut place. It's a barber, barber shop. What is a barber shop? It means pretty much only men go there. Very difference between a hairstylist feeling place and a barbershop place. Barbershop is, you know, kind of tough guys. There's a lady who works there and she cuts my hair. But a lot of guys, 
you know, uh, gun magazines on the table, that sort of thing, right? Um, if you want to learn about haircut English, by the way, you can check out my video that I posted a few years ago. Uh, the, I w actually went to a place to get a haircut and showed the process and taught the vocabulary. Anyway, that's not the reason I'm sharing this. So I got my haircut and I realized this time it was a guy cutting my hair that that guy who was cutting my hair at this barber shop, which is about... 15 minutes away from my house, is my neighbor. He lives only 40 seconds. If you walk 40 seconds, you can be at his house. So that was crazy, this whole large region. And this guy is my neighbor. All right. Then I went to this, uh, with my new haircut, I went to this dinner thingy. And the one of the people there... This was, by the way, about 45 minutes away. So the 40 minute drive, 45 minute drive, something like that, to get to the place. So it's far away from where I live, right? And there are how many barber shops between here and there? I don't know, 100? Many. Uh, so I was we were at dinner and the, uh, the one of the guys there said that he had gone to get his hair cut. And I just happened to ask, oh, yeah, where did you go? He said, oh, it's a place called... He said the name of the place. And that was the same place that I had gone. So this person that I had never met before from, a, from somewhere else went to the same barber on the same day as me, and we ended up completely unrelated to that at the same dinner party 40 minutes away. I think that's I think that's weird. That is a coincidence. I think that's crazy. Uh, Doctrix says, could you please talk a little bit about ghetto English? Um, I'm not sure that's the right word. John McWhorter calls that black English. And I think actually he's much more qualified to talk about this than me. So if you just go on to YouTube and you search John McWhorter and then maybe a black English, because it, it is different. It, you, we have to recognize it as kind of like an, a, dia, a dialect, right? It, it's a thing. Um, I'll, I'll put it in for you and then you can search that yourself. He's much more qualified as a linguist to share this than I am. John McWhorter, Black English. And there are a lot of different ones. He talks about it a lot in his courses. Obviously, you have to pay for his courses. I do pay for his courses. I take many of his courses because I think he's a great, uh, a great teacher, and I like his teaching style a lot. But um, here's one of his talks at Google. John McWhorter, Talking Black, I think is the name of his book. He's written quite a few books and done a lot of courses, but uh, let's see. Here, um, with you, or even the, the notion of Ebonics and where it came from. Um, you may she calls it, she calls it Ebonics. I, I, I feel like that, I feel like that term is kind of out of use. He just calls it black English. Your public debut about 20 years ago during the uproar around uh, Oakland Public School District wanting to a proposal to teach on this and completely misunderstood what was meant by dialect, what was meant by using it in the classroom. And so the big joke was that basically Ebonics, which is a name for black English no one had heard of until then except for a few. Oh, he mentions it there. In about 1973, that this Ebonics was going to be taught in class as opposed to standard English. And this was right around when round-the-clock cable news started. It was Christmas, and so it was a slow news cycle. Okay, yeah, so this is a good place to start. If you want to get the history of it and understand it uh, uh, really well, I would strongly recommend that one, uh, John McWhorter. Baby on board. Hakeem is here. Where are you from, Germany? I'm not from Germany. I'm from the United States, although this behind me is Germany. This is what Germany looks like. Um, if you ever, if you've never been to Germany, as soon as you cross the border, uh, it 
this is what you see. Abdal Salam is here. Hello, thank you for joining. Uh, Wilbur, hello, hello. Hard life, good to have you, of course. Um, uh, Mohammed, wonderful. Taco, 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 taco. And uh, baby on board, what the heck are you talking about? Oh, let me quickly share this. Uh, let me quickly share this around. And then we'll really kick off our first first topic. Keep the questions coming. I will do my best to get to those. Sorry, I couldn't answer the Ebonics or Black English question very well. But. Homer's Barbershop? Homer's Barbershop? What, what is Homer's Barbershop? Um, what, what, what am I trying to do? Oh, yeah. Hold on. Give me a second. Give me a second, please, while I share this, and I am done now. Okay, great. Uh, tell me, what is fancy vocabulary, says Hard Life? I don't know what fancy vocabulary is. That's a good question. What is fancy vocabulary? I've never heard that before. Fancy vocabulary. Is that a thing? It's my first time hearing about fancy vocabulary. Unless you're just asking me to teach words that people would consider to be fancy, but I don't know what that means either. So I, I don't understand. Hey, wait a second. Why is this? Is this the wrong? This is the wrong. Why does the thing have the wrong title today? What the heck? Let me. I gotta change this title. Why does the? Why does our? Why does that? What? We, 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 we. It posted with the wrong title. This is from. Uh, a long time ago. Oh, okay. I fixed it. All right, we're good. I mean, hard level, advanced vocabulary. I mean, what what do you want me to do there? Just start going through a list of random, difficult vocabulary? Is that is that what you want? That's kind of like saying, hey, tell me about everything, right? Where do you begin with that sort of question? I would say, you know, a good place to start would be to have a topic and then focus the vocabulary around that topic and then, you know, kind of go from there. Uh, I I did something like the, hey, here's everything uh, with phrasal verbs and idioms. I taught over 150, is that right? No, 250 uh, in through four courses of idioms and phrases. Again, those are in my courses. You can check those out. I am not going to sit here and just ramble on about specific words that I think most people won't know. That is not what I do, unless there's a reason to do it or it focuses on a specific topic, and I feel like it's useful. But, um, you know, that might be something where I would do like an eight-hour stream for people who are sleeping, right? I've thought about doing that, where I just sort of read words and definitions and example sentences for eight hours and do an eight-hour sort of learn English while you sleep uh video that is something that i want to do in the future because i think it would be fun and interesting but other than that i i just don't see myself uh i don't see myself doing that okay well the stream is fixed and that's good news okay we are live we are live we are loop live live leave leave um but i do have this where the heck is my, where is my uh, giant dictionary? Oh, I know where it is. Give me one second. I will show you something that may or may not uh, impress you. It may or it may not. Give me one second. Okay, you're going to see that the, maybe the one of the largest books you've ever seen in your entire life you're about to see. Are you ready for that?
All right, I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. All right. Hey, Nectar's here. Good to have you. Look at this. I'm going to use it for some future uh, future videos, I think. But I purchased this at an antique store for $24. It is from... God, it's heavy. It is from the year... Oh, look at the binding, though. Look how quality that binding is. It's got metal spikes through it. New Century Dictionary. Um... 4,000 pictorial illustrations, 12,000 quotations. That would be maybe example sentences. Copyright 1957. Okay. And let's just pick out a random word because that's boring. Um, <laughs> what do we have here? Mm, I'm going to try to find a word that I don't know. Okay, here we go. I don't know this one. Apolostic. Apolostic. A-P-O-L-A-U-S-T-I-C. Uh, looks like it comes from Greek. Pertaining or devoted to enjoyment. Hey, that sounds like me. Oh, okay. So it comes from Apollo. That makes sense. Apollo, sort of like Apollonian, maybe. Uh, Blunderbuss, I know that one. I'll do one more of these. Let me see if I can. It has pictures. It has pictures. It's illustrated. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, Clidomancy. All right. Clidomancy or Clidomancy. I'm not quite sure the correct pronunciation. Let's put this right in front of the camera here. Oh, my God. My hands are getting sore. This is the last one. Divination by means of a key. <laughs> What? C L I D O M A N C Y. <laughs> Heavy. Clytomancy. Uh, let's. Okay, I've never heard of that. So, divination is the practice of uh, determining the future or, you know, using some means to say what's going to happen next week or this season or well, that sort of thing. And um, you, there are a lot of ways to do it in a lot of Asian countries. There's a stick, you shake sticks and whatever comes out. Ancient China had a way of doing it uh, using, it's called um, bone, um, bone? Oracle bones, oracle bones, yeah. So they would place a hot metal, hot piece of metal on a shell, a turtle shell or a bone, and depending on which way it would crack, it would tell you something about, for example, the upcoming harvest, something like that. But this is using divination using a key. So this is a a new one for me. So let's check this out. All right. So, uh, Clydomancy. Is this even still a thing? How to... Okay, I'm not seeing anything here. This must be really uncommon or not done at all. Unless I've spelled it wrong. Have I spelled it correctly? Clydomancy. Don't worry, we're going to get to our first topic soon. Clydomancy. Divination by means of key dangling from a thread key dangling and yet i'm not seeing it at all here interesting it must be a a dead practice huh native american event okay well i guess cleidomancy is a thing we'll have to bring back maybe i'll be the guy to bring back cleidomancy I have a lot of keys on my keychain. I could jangle them and tell you the future. Sounds easy. Sounds very easy. Yeah, that is a dictionary. I'm sorry to say it is a dictionary. Promise. It is a dictionary. Uh, we've got a question about Abe, about the assassination of Abe from Japan. I don't know that much about it. 
generally speaking, people being assass- assassinated is no reason to celebrate. In general. <laughs> I don't even think I celebrated when... Everyone was celebrating when... Um, Osama bin Laden got assassinated. I didn't feel happy. Why, why, why should I, you know? So I, whenever someone gets assassinated, that sucks. Life is, life is uh, short, I guess. I don't know. I don't know any of the, I don't know any of the politics behind it. You're eager to sound like my brother? If you've been watching some of my old videos, he made a few videos for the channel uh, when I first started ma- started making YouTube videos. So he definitely does sound a bit different from me. My little brother is a pastor. Uh, he's a Christian pastor. He teaches about about Jesus and stuff. That's what he does. He's a, so he's a speaker. He talks a lot. Everyone in my family, most people in my family, three out of five are speakers professionally. I'm a professional speaker. This is what I do for a living. My little brother is a professional speaker. He's a preacher. My father is also a speaker. So a lot of talkers. A lot of talking. Okay. So here's what I want to do. My first, The first topic I want to talk about today. Um, I've just heard them. Okay. So... What I'd like to do is look up or try to figure out the meaning of some words that I'm hearing around, which I don't think I fully understand. An English teacher doesn't understand English words? Yeah, that's right. I have a giant dictionary that's about this thick, and I don't know most of those words. Most people use on a daily basis up to 10,000 words. Most people know generally between somewhere between 20 and 50,000 words, with 50 being kind of on the high end. Some people have a really advanced vocabulary. They might be around 50. There are over, well over 200,000 words in the English language. So a lot of them are dead or very specialized, and so most people just don't know them. So put aside the idea that you should learn all English words, because not even the most advanced English user doesn't know even half of them. All right. But how do words come about? Well, through usage. And often new words come out with the younger generation. So... I'm, I'm an old man now. I'm 59 years old. And so I'm not, my generation is kind of done creating new words, I feel like. We came up with a few because we were responsible for the first internet culture sort of wordscape. <laughs> so I'm proud of that, the millennials, right? But there's a new generation coming up and they have a lot of words that when I hear them, I don't always understand them, words and phrases. So I'm, I'm going to try to learn them by searching, and we'll see how it goes. And there are three that I want to talk about, and then one that I guess we could consider to be a kind of idiom. The first is based. The second is stan, S-T-A-N. And the third is chad. Now, I think I understand chad pr- kind of, from what I've seen, but I want to understand its usage a little bit better. And so we're going to just explore this a bit. Okay, I'm learning. So you're kind of learning with me. I I didn't search this before. I'm learning these three. Again, I think I have kind of some idea. I've just heard them around, especially a lot of kids these days who are, you know, 18, 19 years old are, are, are saying them. So Let's start with, I'm going to use the classic thing that I always use, which may be boring to you, but it's the free dictionary. It's my favorite. Now, words enter the dictionary at different times in different dictionaries. Some, like the Urban Dictionary, aren't official, and so they pretty much just have slang in them. Some, like Dictionary.com or Webster's or any of those, They will add them as they want to add them. 
based on their regularity, the regularity of the words. So I don't even know if these words are going to be there. So we'll have to figure out, if we can't find them here, another way to understand them. So let's start with based. All right, base. Ba no, I want to know specifically based, not base, base, base. I'm just browsing through the uh, definitions here. A line used in reference to measurement, electronics, based, uh, based in a new company. No, I know that meaning. Based her conclusions, base station. No, off base, I know. All right. Um, baser, basest, having shown a lack of decency, contemptible. No, I know that meaning. I know all the meaning so far, but it's not the use I'm looking for. Uh, adjective based, firmly based ice, um, having a base of operation. Nope, not what I'm looking for. Base, I don't know, that's not what I'm, okay. So I don't think the free dictionary has it. So what I'm going to do is search what, what does based mean? And I'm gonna, f I'm, I'm assuming, oops, not, not based, based, what the heck? I'm assuming that it will know what I'm what I'm looking for, as in a new a new thing, right? Slang, slang by dictionary.com. Okay, I'll check that out. Open up a tab on that. I'm a tab guy. I like to open up tabs. They call me the tab man. Uh, all right, based. Here we go. This is from Urban Dictionary. Now you have to be careful with this because Urban Dictionary is not going to be adding things that are formal phrases. A lot of them are sort of dirty sexual slang you come across some crazy stuff okay a word used when you agree with something or when you want to recognize someone for being themselves courageous and unique or not caring okay so what i've heard is something like a based take or that's based right so that kind of agrees with my understanding the opposite of cringe, that's helpful. Sometimes the opposite of bi biased, okay. Cringe, if something, that I know, if something is cringe, it's so awkward. It's like watching The Office. You know, when you watch The Office, it's so uncomfortable. That's cringe. If something happens that's so awkward, you'd say, oh, that's so cringe, right? Uh, if I, for example, search dictionary.com, they don't have base. Oh, it's so cringe. But I think I could say, Based on this, a word used to agree with something or when you want to recognize someone for being themselves. I kind of want, I wonder if I could recognize Urban Dictionary. Urban Dictionary is based because they just have, they just have the stuff that I need and they're not afraid of not looking formal. When used in online political language, it can mean based in fact or opposed, uh, opposite of bias due to the number of a number of people who saw it being first used seriously. All right. Interesting. That's interesting. Let's check out what dictionary.com has. Okay, based. And this is dictionary.com's slang section, slang dictionary. I think it's very cool, by the way, that dictionary.com has a slang dictionary. What does based mean? Based is a slang term that originally meant to be added to crack cocaine or <laughs> or acting like you were, but was reclaimed by rapper Lil B for being yourself and not caring what others think of you to carry yourself with swagger. So this seems to be the common definition between the two, not the political definition of being the opposite of biased, but sort of like you're based. That is a based take. That's just you being you. That's what you think. It's not even necessarily that you agree with me, but just that it's, well, it's being yourself. It's not being too, maybe too cautious to carry yourself. Maybe with a swagger would be to have some confidence. All right. I think I understand the meaning. Now, what I would want to do, which I will not do now, is I would want to find examples in daily use. That's the next step. I get the idea. Okay. Now I watch uh, videos and listen to music and podcasts, and I listen to it in context. 
Does that mean I'm going to, once I understand it and I've seen those examples, start using it all the time? Probably not. Why? Because I'm 59. I'm not 22. So I feel like, yeah, if you're 19 or 20 or 21 or 22, 25 even, maybe you can use that because that's your word. It's a way to kind of identify you within that generation. I'm not in that generation, the Zoomers. So I uh, I probably won't use it, but it's good to know, right? Here's a meme. Thank you, based God. Interesting. Okay. Looks like, they, oh, it looks like they have... A video I could watch. Cool. Okay. Based means being yourself, not being scared of what people think of you, not being afraid to do what you want to do. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Cool. So we've got based. I feel like I've got based pretty well. Based mom. <laughs> okay. It's getting weird. Time to stop. <laughs> it's getting weird. Oh, examples of based. I'm enjoying the based life, living my best life. Since little bit B claims to have access to uh, this higher power known as the based God, he was able to curse. Okay, no, I, I do not understand that. But, okay. It's kind of spreading. It seems to have started with this specific wrapper and now is, now is spreading. All right. Now, the next one I want to search is Stan. Now, obviously, Stan is someone's name, but I want to look at Stan as a verb. I've heard it like this. We stan you right? Okay. I, I, I think I get what they're trying to say, but I want to understand more context. And overly, okay, so this is showing Stan. This is a dictionary.com and it looks like it's in the dictionary. Uh, it's not showing Stan as a, as a name because it's lowercase here. So noun, an overly enthusiastic fan, especially of a celebrity. Uh, okay. So that would be something like I doubt there are any Luke stands, but if there were, we would call them Luke stands. They are people who are very enthusiastic, but I'm, I'm probably not famous enough to have any of those. Uh, verb to be overly enthusiastic, uh, an overly enthusiastic fan of something or someone. He's my favorite rapper, but I don't stand for. Okay, this is what I was looking for. Do I stand for him? Or do I stan him? This is what I wonder. If you stand for them, that means you sort of, I support, I'm supporting them, but I do it for them, or I just do them, stand them, stand for or stand them. Okay, so this is stand for. I want to know, so it's just like being a very big fan of something. He's my favorite rapper, but I don't stand him. So if he's your favorite, then why don't you stan him? Hold on. Okay, hold on. If you're, he's my fave rapper, but I don't stand for him. So there must be some sort of line between uh, being favored and standing. Like favorite, I like him a lot, but I'm not, I haven't lost my mind over him. If I lose my mind and I f go to his house and try to figure out, you know, where he goes to eat brunch, then maybe I stand for him. Maybe that would be an obsessed fan or something like that. Uh, let's go to the Urban Dictionary and do a little digging there. Okay, here we go. Urban Dictionary. Stan. Just search Stan. Okay. Um, okay, not the Eminem song. I know that one. Uh, in term, okay, the term means a very, very overzealous and obsessed fan of a celebrity band cast of a TV show movie. Okay. All right. So that's similar. Overzealous would be not just your favorite, but kind of losing your mind over how much you love it. Okay. Here we see not a stan of, but just stan legends. Okay. Stan means you look up to that person. You, uh, you watch them or you truly love their content. It's another word for saying idolize. You idolize someone or something, you would say, I stand blank instead of, I love that person. Oh, this is much more clear. I really like this one. Okay, so that this one, this meaning seems to suggest not being obsessed, but just really admire that person. So I stand, who do I stand? I stand Terrence McKenna. That's who I, maybe, eh, maybe not that much. 
you love that person's work and there we don't have to have of so it looks like it can be used not i mean for sorry it looks like it can be used with for stand for them my favorite but i don't stand for him or can be used without for cool yeah, not it's not stand, but that's where it could be confusing. Because if you say, I stand for that, it could sound like I stand for that, which is a totally different meaning. That has a meaning, but it's a different, a different meaning. Okay. Oh, look, student loans. Love those. All right, last one. Here we go. Oh, he's accidentally zoomed in way too much. <laughs> All right, last one. I'm just sticking with Urban Dictionary because I'm finding this to be quite useful. Uh, Chad, uh, this is the one I feel like I understand best. I, I feel like Chad is the, is a strong, manly man with a, with a strong jaw who is the perfect man or something like that. A Chad. I've even heard a giga Chad, um, residue of fecal matter. No, that's not what we want. That's not what we want. No, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Uh oh! Nope! 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 <laughs> this is not no 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 no. <laughs> this is where Urban Dictionary can go wrong. Uh, okay, these are all gross. That's not it. What is a Chad? Please, please don't read. Lead me in the wrong direction. Ah, okay. Here we go. A Wikipedia article. All right. I'm gonna go with this one to be very careful because it looks like this one has. A, a gross meaning as well related to butt cracks and poop. <sighs> okay. The slang term Wikipedia. Love Wikipedia. The slang term Chad has historic... Okay, so they're capitalizing it. That, that was my error. Do not use lowercase Chad. It has to be capitalized as in the name. All right, got it. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. The slang term Chad has historically been used in different contexts. It originated in the UK where it was used to describe a particular hum humorous, humorous, humorous ad hoc cartoon. All right. Um, where it was used as a derogatory description for young upper class urban males. In modern Internet slang, the term generally refers to an alpha or otherwise hyper masculine male wow okay hyper masculine so super macho i when i when i think the word chad the first thing that pops into my head is this sort of extremely kind of square jaw the slang term chad originated in the uk blah 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 okay manosphere the term later came into use in incel forums this is where i think i've heard it to refer to sexually active alpha males Chads are viewed as constituting the top. What is what is this word? What is D D E C I L E? I'm not. I don't even. I don't know this word. What the heck is this word? Can I? Okay, look up. Um, each of ten equal groups, which a population can be divided according. Oh, okay. Decile. In terms of genetic fitness in online animations, drawings in the Manosphere, a chat is further tagged with... Uh, okay, okay, okay. So I, this is where I've heard it. Um, you've got the incel group, who st which stands for involuntary, involuntary celibate, um, which is a, a group, internet culture group, um, generally kind of resentful, spends a lot of time online, um, resentful of not getting, uh, not not being sexually active, for example, especially with women and not being able to be. Uh, they're involuntary, which means they don't, they don't want that. But, and then I think the Chad is the opposite. Super male who gets all of those ladies because he's so macho and so cool. I've heard the term Giga Chad. Chad is usually dis, uh, is a usually disparaging back on dictionaries slang. 
uh, internet slang term for a po uh, popular, confident, sexually attractive young white male. Okay, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that. Its female counterpart is Stacy, who is often portrayed as Chad's sexual partner. Chad is associated with the incel community and the website 4chan. Okay, alpha male. So it's sort of like alpha male. Okay. He is depicted as attractive, successful, muscular, cocky, and very popular among women. So you're not your name is not Chad. You're you are a Chad. But if you're a Chad, you gotta spell it with a capital C. Chads, bunch of Chads over there. It's like how well you wouldn't know the reference. Dr. Stephen Brule calls those hunks bunch of hunks. Chad is uh Chad, so you can have multiple Chads lifting weights over there, getting all the ladies. Tad, chads typically resemble the common dude bro figure of a young, athletic white male who wears trendy clothing and only enjoys popular things. All right. Interesting. All right. So I learned a lot. I hope you did sort of through me discovering this. These are things I didn't fully grasp. I, I felt better about Chad now that sort of reinforces my understanding because I haven't actually looked up this stuff before. But now we know Stan, Chad, and Based. And I would say, you know, if we, if we know those things, that could potentially make us fairly based. And I stand people who are based. <laughs> but I do not stand Chads because Chads are just dude bros and they, um, they get everything they want. And who likes that? The last one I wanted to look up was on God. And maybe I'll do that later, but I think we'll leave it at those three words. I challenge you to do this same process with on God. Another phrase that I've heard floating around among the Zoomers. Look it up. See if you can figure out what it means, how it's used, and let me know what you come up with. Taco Taco Art says, do you know Lex Friedman's podcast? I watched his episode with Bishop Robert Barron weeks ago. I can't really understand, but I can understand the concept. I like uh, Lex Friedman's podcast. I, I really do. Uh, yes, there are some topics. Not I haven't seen that one. There are some topics which are very technical when they're getting into mathematics and physics and coding sometimes i don't understand well often i don't understand the very technical stuff but you can still follow the track of the conversation and understand the broad sort of higher level things so i really like uh, lex friedman's podcast a lot actually i like it okay joan says can you feel my heart hold on let me see Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. Got it. Done. Nice one. Warm. Petra, hi from Austria. Hello, welcome. Hi from Venezuela, says Gregory. Hi, hi, hi. Borka. Borka, Borka, Borka. Uh, can you please explain what it means? Yes, let me answer Borka's question because that's a good one. I like it. And Mako2000 has a question, which I'd like to get to. You want to get, um, how can we difference between American accent and Canadian accent? Oh, wow, that's a lot of good questions coming in here. Borka Siamese says, Hello, Luke. I read in a UK magazine a phrase like, It will cost north of X dollars. Could you please explain what it means? And is it a common expression in the US? Thanks. It is a common expression. You hear it quite often. I don't use it very often, but I hear it a lot. So it, it's common. Think of what north means. Often north, we think of as up, even though it's not, it's not really up. I mean, you look up, you see the sky or the ceiling, but when we look at the world or a map of the world, an atlas, we associate north with up, south with down. We say down there, up there, right? I'm going up north, 
up north to Canada, for example, up north to, uh, well, but Canada would be the only place north of me, the only country north of me, up north to Buffalo. And east and west, we don't use, for example, left and right for those usually. But especially for north and south, we associate those with up and down. So once you got that, I think it's pretty easy to understand. If you say it's north of $10,000, that means 10,000 is the lowest number it could be, but it's probably more than that. And when would we use it? We would say that when we're not exactly sure what the price is, but we might want to emphasize how expensive something is. Let's say, for example, you want to do a, a, a renovation on your home or an extension on your home, change something, a major project. You'll need to buy materials, hire workers, all of that stuff. And you're trying to estimate how much it will be and you say it's going to be north of $30,000. North of 30000 means, I'm guessing, but probably even more than that. Now, does that mean it could be $10 million? No, we use the number 30000 to give a rough number and to say it will be around there, but I think it will be more than that. But it's not just any number more than that. There's a reason I say 30, not 50, not 80, right? North of 30 means maybe 32 or 35 or 37, something like that, right? Otherwise, I would say if it's higher than 40, north of 40 <laughs> or north of 10 million, for example, that's how we would use that. Now, could it be, could it be used for other things, not money related? That guy, that guy looks like he's north of 60. Yeah, sometimes you hear things like that for age, for amounts of things in general when you're not sure what it is but you're pretty sure it's higher than something whether it's age or the amount of money that you might spend or how much something costs right uh, I paid north of thirty thousand dollars for that uh, for that secondhand car might as well have purchased a new one right so it's very common I feel like I don't use it that much but that doesn't mean you shouldn't it's just not my personal preference. Hopefully now you get the idea and it's a very good question. Datui. Like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. What does it mean? Adore. Adore means you absolutely love something or someone. I adore you, for example. Adore would be more common for people rather than for... Uh, things, but people do use it for things like I adore the Beatles, for example, that would be a music group or I adore birdhouses. You can say that too. I, again, not a word I use. I don't like it, but people like it. 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 Uh, if you guys haven't already done so, would appreciate if you could hit the like button button that is very helpful support the channel hit the like button also feel free to uh subscribe and you can get a free course in the links in the description or a longer course building your english brain is on sale also in the links in the description big sale happening on that one i think it's about 80 percent off uh mako 2000 mako 2000 says i have such a problem I know grammar at B1 level, but I speak English very badly. How do you think this problem can be solved? This is the classic problem, right? Where you know grammar pretty well, and when you read, you can understand things pretty well. And maybe even when you're listening, you can understand pretty well. But when you speak, it doesn't come out right. It doesn't sound correct. You make a lot of mistakes, pronunciation issues, grammar issues even, even though you know the grammar. Why did I say that? Did I just use the past tense when I should have used the past perfect tense? Ah, and you know what's correct. And if you were to go back and listen to yourself, you would say, what did I say there? How could I have said that? What's going on here? By the way, same with writing. Often people's writing is not nearly as good as their comprehension. Why? Why? This is such a common issue. This is my entire career is based on this issue. <laughs> That's why I 
do this. It's why I make courses. It's why, it's why I do what I do. Because you learn stuff in school as input. And the only output that you get, generally speaking, is maybe a composition a little bit, maybe some quizzes, and you have to learn it, and then that's it. But there's no context for using it, for practicing it all the time. And so the issue tends to be that you've learned all about something with no way to practically apply what you've learned. But if you think about learning anything, the only way to get good at it is to practically apply what you've learned, to put it into practice. Well, you might say, yes, but in school, I had to put it into practice. I had so many tests, exams, and quizzes. Yeah, so you're good at tests, exams, and quizzes. Great. But using the language is not the same as a test or exam or quiz. Perfect example. I love to use golf examples. You go to the driving range. The driving range, range, range. The driving range is where you just hit golf balls. I do it all the time. And sometimes I go there and I, I hit 30 in a row, just perfectly straight. And I think, mm, I'm good at hitting golf balls. <laughs> so I say, all right, now I'm going to go out and golf nine holes of golf. Well, when you go golfing, when you golf nine holes of golf, you're not just hitting golf balls. You have to connect everything together. Sometimes you're hitting a far shot with this club, and then you have to change clubs and hit another one that's shorter. And then you have to, once you're on the green, then you have to putt. And that's a totally different thing. So you're connecting the skills together. What I usually find is that all of my practice on the driving range in that controlled setting doesn't apply very well to golfing. <laughs> Nine holes of golf or 18 holes of golf. I think, why am I, why? I hit the ball straight 30 times in a row. Why am I not doing it now, right? It's because it's part of a more complicated activity. And I haven't practiced that as much as I've practiced at the driving range. So what would I do to get better? I would go golfing every single day, doing the whole thing, driving and chipping and putting and walking and thinking and measuring, all of that stuff that you have to do. A lot of it is mental. There's a big mental part of golf. Why am I saying this? It's the same exact thing for learning English. Great, you're good at quizzes and all of that stuff and your comprehension is great and your grammar is great. But how often do you practice speaking with people? Not very often? Oh, well, it's not surprising that you're not very good at it because you have to then figure out how to connect all of those skills together in a completely new kind of experience, which is communication, conversations. And you can get that. You can join an online book club and have conversations every single week. You can have language exchange partners if you can find a good partner and practice regularly. You can take classes, one-on-one -on -one classes with a teacher to practice if you're willing to pay for something like that. Please don't ask me, I don't do that. But you can, you can do that sort of thing if you want regular practice. You can play video games and on the live chat, you can have conversations and communicate about strategy and things like that. There's so many ways to practice. But it's not surprising that you struggle with it because you haven't done it enough. So you just have to do it more, do it a lot. And if you find yourself feeling nervous or afraid in those situations, you have to push through, try your best. Don't worry too much about looking stupid or silly. Everybody's stupid. I mean, who cares? Just try your best and you will gain confidence, gain skill. It's not only about skill. Confidence is a big part of it. And pretty soon you will find that those skills that you know begin to creep into your conversation usage and you feel much more natural. And then you find, oh, I can use that grammar. I can use that pronunciation more easily. But first, you have to get comfortable in those live conversation situations. Hopefully that helps. Great question. Amazing question.
Okay, Jose, Ricardo, Sierra. Whoa, that's a long name. Colombia. Hey, I love your country. I've only been there once, but I did enjoy it. Hello, Shabazz. Hello and welcome. Appreciate you joining. Good to have you here. Could you please tell what to be consistent? Can you please tell what, how to be consistent in order to improve English? I think I kind of just covered that a bit. Thank you, Borka. Much appreciated. I appreciate that. Much appreciated. I appreciate it. Much appreciated. Oh, I think I need to take a coffee break. I talk too much on these. I wonder what you guys think I'm like outside of doing these sorts of uh English lessons, right? Because your interactions with me, whether it's comments on videos or the chat or just watching, uh, is you you see me talking constantly. That's all I do is I, I talk constantly. Do you think that I'm like that all the time? If so, you would be wrong. I'm extremely quiet. Um, unless, well, some situations I will be chatty, but Normally, I like to be quiet, not say anything, sit, read, walk, think, look at the sky, not say anything. I actually don't talk that much. I'm not much of a talker. But what are you going to do? In a lesson, you got to do it. You got to do it. You belong to India. I think it's probably better, Jay Deep, just to say you're from India instead of belong. How are you, Mohammed? Thank you for joining from Facebook. Awesome. Um, Abdul Malik is here also. You appreciate my effort. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining. Like button and subscribe, folks. Much appreciated. Or follow if you're joining from Facebook. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Now, I want to talk about video games. If that's okay. If you don't mind, I want to talk about video games. It is a question I get fairly often. A lot of English learners say, can I learn English from music? Can I learn English from movies and TV shows? Can I learn English from video games? And if any of those is yes, which one is best or what, man? Exp how, what should I do? How should I consume this kind of stuff and learn? Well, the first answer is yes, you can learn, learn English from all of those. You can learn English from music. You can learn English from movies and TV shows. You can learn English from video games. In my opinion, they are not all equal. And I want to focus on video games because I think that if you do it correctly, you can learn more from video games than movies, TV shows, and music. Of these, music is the worst, in my opinion. Why? Because the lyrics in music are not like spoken English. So you might pick up words here and there, but you don't know if that's how people normally speak. Movies and TV shows are better because you are getting words, phrases, idioms, cultural references in context, right? But it's one way. You're writing them down, maybe you're looking them up, but there's no interaction. In video games, potentially, you're getting much more interaction. So you're getting a lot of those words and phrases, you're still learning things, but it's more immersive, you're part of the story, you're making decisions, and sometimes you understanding what someone is saying is a requirement. You're not required to understand what someone says when you're watching a movie or listening to a song, but sometimes you cannot take an action unless you understand what this says or unless you understand what this person is saying. And so there's a bit more pressure that feels a bit more like daily life, right? If you get a job and English is required at your job, sometimes you understanding what that guy or that lady said is required 
in order for you to do your job correctly. And if you don't understand, you fail, <laughs> you get fired. Well, that's pressure. Pressure is a good thing. You want that when it comes to language learning and video games can provide that, but again, in different ways. So what I'd like to do is talk about a couple of different ways that you can learn from video games if that's something that you're interested in and then recommend a game or two for each type of learning. And we're going to start simply with a lot of content coming at you, particularly reading. There are some games that require you to understand a lot of things in order to solve puzzles. So you might play a game like Fallout. Fallout is a game where the world ends, there's a nuclear disaster, and you have to survive, basically. And one of the things that the game involves is reading a lot. And there's a lot of listening, too. So you have to listen to a lot of instructions and take action on those instructions. And in order to, for example, open a door, you have to first read these four pages of this, comprehend it. And once you understand it, you then figure out how to open the door. So, and this is a game that, that I've played quite a bit. It's called, it's called Fallout. There's Fallout 3, Fallout 4. There are different ones, but it's pretty interesting. It's very immersive. And you have the chance to, I think, see your language learning improvement impact how well you play the game. So that would be one option. Now, another is where you have to respond with choices. A classic one of these is uh, you might not be interested in Star Wars, but if you're interested in Star Wars, it would be Knights of the Old Republic. I actually played it on iPad. And it's a lot of choices that you have to make. Somebody will say something. You can also read the text on the screen and you need to choose a response. Would you, do you want to say this, this, or this? You have to understand the three responses. And based on that, they will take an action. Or you might change a little bit because sometimes you become an evil character or a good character based on which one you choose. Another one that's more recent is Genshin Impact. I actually have a friend who, who works on the game. It's a very cool game. It is actually a free game and you interact with the characters based on what they say or as as speaking or what they say in writing. Some of the more popular characters or common characters that you meet, they have voiceover. So you listen to what they're saying. Then you choose a response. And sometimes you encounter a character. For example, there's a, a trainer who teaches you how to cook. And that person doesn't always speak. So you have to read what they're saying. You read the text and then you choose a response based on that. So you have to there regularly interact like you would in a normal conversation, which is pretty interesting. So I would recommend for that sort of game, something like Genshin Impact is pretty good. And again, that one is free and it is it is a pretty fun game. Honestly, it's a kind of open world adventure game where you can do what you like you gain magical powers, you do quests and things like that. And it's it's pretty, pretty fun. Now, what if you want to interact with other real people, right? These are all, so far I've mentioned text that's been written by the game developers or NPCs, that's what they're called, NPCs, uh, characters that have planned speech, right? What if you want to interact with the real people? That's great. I would recommend there choosing a game where the chat function is really important. A lot of shooter games or first person shooter games depend on the chat function in order to play well. You can turn it off, you can turn it on, but if you want to practice, you can build a team in Call of Duty and you're talking with those people, right? You're having conversations where to go strategically, what to do next, right? Which weapons to use, where the enemy is, where this rare weapon is, right? Call of Duty would be a good choice. There's one on mobile called Call of Duty Mobile, which I really like. It's one of my favorite games. 
You can play with a controller on your iPad or phone, which is very cool. And you're talking with people all the time if you choose to. You don't absolutely have to. Or something like Fortnite, which is also a also a free game. And you can play it on mobile. You can play it on PlayStation X. Every platform has has Fortnite. And you can use that function too. A team of two, a team of three, and you can build friendships with people based on that, right? You build groups and you play at a regular time, three times a week, and that's your team. And you get to know those people and you practice speaking English along the way. And it's really fun. Fortnite is honestly extremely addicting. I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to become addicted to it. I've only started playing it recently, but it's pretty great. Then you can get into the world of Discord servers. So if you really like a game, not just those, but if you really like a game, you will often find a Discord server attached to that game. You can join the server, you can chat, you can share things that happen, strategies. It's a community. So in addition to playing any game, see if you can find a Discord server or perhaps a Reddit group associated with that game to then have a community around it. That would be a great way to get immersion. Now there's one last type. And I think this is the type where you're learning the cultural references, you're learning maybe the humor, you're learning uh, things as you would in a story, right? If you're reading a book. So it's more like reading, except it's a lot of listening. So it's like listening to, almost like listening to a podcast. There is some interaction. You do have to make choices as well, like the earlier examples that I mentioned. But it's more, a lot of it is background. It's voiceover, sometimes funny, sometimes serious. And two examples pop to mind in, immediately. One is called Trover versus the Universe. I believe that's what it's called. And this one is... Sorry, Trover saves the universe, not Trover versus the universe. This is a hilarious game created by Justin Roiland. So if you like, if you like uh, Rick and Morty, this is one of the creators of Rick and Morty. Morty. He created a universe, or a game called Trover saves the universe, and it's a lot of voiceover. You hear so much voiceover, and it's all really, really funny. You could even, if you don't want to play the game, watch gameplay on YouTube just to sort of get a lot of cultural references and understand English humor. And then another classic one is the Stanley Parable. So this one does require you to understand what the narrator is saying, but the whole game is narrated by a voice and there's kind of an interaction. It's a weird game, an interaction between you and the narrator and the narrator is saying what you're doing and so it's interesting but you can pick up a lot of interesting language from the stanley parable and games like this i'm not saying just these games i'm giving some examples of course new games are always coming out but these are just different ways to learn from games and i think there are more ways to learn from video games than from movies tv shows and music. Not that you shouldn't use those too. So I've given you an excuse to play video games. All right. So go play video games, but make sure you're doing it the right way. Make sure you're getting the most out of the experience. Make sure you're actually picking up and using, very important, using the English language as you play. Okay. Hopefully, I'm curious what games you guys like. Um, Skyrim NPC. Yeah, Skyrim. Yeah, the NPCs in Skyrim might be interesting. I've played that one a bit. Um, Motley Crue talks about English slow and pretty clear. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Jose, uh, what is Nikki, Nikki Six? Nikki Six interview. Let's check that out. Just curious. Oh, I've seen this guy. I'm familiar with this guy. Ah, I think I might have seen one of these interviews, actually. Let's see here. 
I think this guy, doesn't he go around speaking about addiction and he teaches people basically how bad drugs are um, and how to not get addicted to them or how he got addicted to sort of, I, I, I think I've, I think that's what he does. Let's check this out. How At the height that? of your heroin abuse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You had a closet in your mm -hmm. house where you like to go in that closet and vomit. I like to go in the in the closet and oh. do drugs because when you're, especially on cocaine, you're getting paranoid. Mm -hmm. You want to be in a confined place. So right. it became my little ritual place. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't vomit in the closet. I would somehow make it to the ah. bathroom. I see. But listen, here's the thing. Okay. Heroin makes you throw up. Right. Cocaine, when you inject it, makes you throw up. So you were injecting. I was injecting, I was smoking, wow. I was doing the whole the whole. And, and you were buying drugs in bulk. In other words, you were smart. Yeah, he's got a nice voice, but it doesn't compare to Howard Stern's voice. Howard Stern's voice is so nice. He has a deep, rich, buttery voice. He's got such a nice voice. Both Howard and um, everyone on his show um, uh it sounds nice. What is the the lady on his show is um, what's, what's smart her drug name? addict. What I call a smart drug addict because I don't watch a lot of money you do. Yes, such Why a don't you just buy a bunch? Of what the heck is her name? Um, Howard and I, for, I forget. Drugs, her name. so you have them there. It's like a carton of cigarettes. You know, if right. you're a cigarette smoker, you get a carton when you go out. Yeah, be, right. she's Why got a really be nice. So voice tied too. to your oh, heroin that dealer you have every to minute. See him every day. I mean, if you could be into saying that you're a smart. Drug addict is kind of like <laughs> kind saying of it's kind of like yeah. saying when someone said to me the other day they go you know you're the brains of Motley Crue. <laughs> I was but like you know what I mean. Wait. If you're good. <sighs> okay, don't do drugs, guys. Addicted to games, yeah, that's not good. Every, a lot of anything can be addicting, I suppose. Some things are healthier addictions than others. Like if you're addicted to exercise, I guess that's a little healthier than being addicted to most other things i think a video game addiction is not great because it makes you less productive but definitely better than than drugs uh drives me crazy why can't i remember her name the co-host on howard stern donna no ah very frustrating i need to watch more howard stern I don't really, I don't really watch it very much, but I should. All right, let's see if we missed any questions here. Would be awesome to have a Howard, deep Howard Stern voice, always talking like this. A very nice, a very nice voice, gentle, soothing. Mm. Um. Thank you, Ab 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 Abdul Malik. I appreciate that. J Deep, I have purchased your pronunciation course on Udemy. Useful for IELTS. Very good to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, all right. I have. I want to get to something else here. Okay, um, of course what? There are, there are things that are unique to any culture. It's, it can be tricky to identify what those things are because there are no clear lines, right? Of course, there are exceptions to everything. So when we describe things that are unique to a culture, we're giving a generality. And we know, of course, okay, there are going to be a million exceptions. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't identify trends. It can be interesting. Especially, for example, if you're thinking about going to that place, 
and interacting with people who live in that culture. And you want to you want to know some things about it before you get there so that you don't make a huge mistake. Right. For example, going to Japan, you want to know about some customs, some norms so that you don't look like a big, dumb idiot when you get there. Right. China, same thing. When I got to China, I didn't look up anything. I was a kid, basically. And I did some dumb things, very dumb things. Then I learned, right? So there are some things also true about America that can help you, for example, if you visit America, but also understand the context of the context of the language, right? The language is situated in the culture. So the English language, yes, but American English in particular and how it fits with how it fits with the culture more broadly. So again, these are just trends, but let's take a look at a list of, let's call them cultural characteristics. And 101 of these have been compiled by the University of Michigan Press. I want to see if I agree with them or don't agree with them, but let's just hop in. I think it'll be, I think it'll be an interesting exercise. Let's Let's see if these are right, wrong, strange, universal, un actually unique to America or or what. OK, so one hundred and one. Again, these are these are not from me. One hundred and one characteristics of Americans or American culture. That's by itself kind of a loaded term. Americans who well, my wife is an American, but she spent the first 25 years of her life in China. So she doesn't have the same cultural background, but she is an American. So, well, what about that? So, of course, it's gen generalities. All right. Da, 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 da. America is enormous, the third largest country in the world with a population of more than 300 million people. That's not a cultural thing. All right. Americans come in all colors have all types of religions and speak many languages from all over the world. Very true. Americans are extremely independent, individualistic, and like to be different from each other. Generally, I think that is true, although there are many exceptions. I know many Americans who are not independent, who lived with their parents until the age of 30 or not individualistic at all. So not universal, but generally true. 66% of Americans are overweight. 37% are obese. That means dangerously overweight. I think that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that help you? I mean, uh, you, you got to move around people in the shopping. When you're going shopping, it you have to walk around, further around people because they're so big. And look out for those little electric carts because sometimes people are so fat that they need a little cart to drive around in Walmart in order to get around. Uh, some people can't walk on their own, they're so fat. Americans believe in freedom of choice. Generally speaking, I would say that's pretty true. That's a common American norm. Americans need a lot of elbow room. They like personal space around them. Yeah, I think so. A lot of people don't like to be too close to other, other people. And there are different norms around this, around the world. I've been to some places where that is the opposite of true. And I wasn't used to it at first. Well, people are so close to me. Got to adjust. Approximately 1% of Americans are homeless. All right. I'll trust them on that. Sounds about right. So many in, for example, New York and California. Uh, we're just going to do, by the way, not all 100 because it's a lot. I will link this, uh, link this below if you want to check out all of them. But uh, we'll go through the first the first let's say 25, just to just to get a sense for them. Americans talk easily to homeless, but use good judgment and are careful with whom they talk. No, I don't know what that means. That's a big generalization. I think number eight here is really weird, and I would have left that out. Talk easily with the homeless. Really? Uh, that's a very person by person thing. I don't know if you could make that trend. Sadly, the streets of major cities are often dirty. Well, yes, that's true. Okay, fair enough. New York is so dirty, but I like it. 
<laughs> I like how real New York is. Subway is disgusting, but it's awesome. Many people, especially teenagers, wear strange clothes and have many tattoos and body piercings. What? That is such a strange generalization. This is crazy. There are a lot of people in their, I would say just as many people in their 40s have tattoos because they used to be teenagers. Uh, and I feel like tattoos are becoming less common among, for example, the Zoomer uh, generation. They don't have a lot of tattoos. My generation, the millennials, I would say generally a fair amount. But th that's great. I don't think that's right at all. Americans follow the rule of law? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the law. Got to follow the law or you go to jail. Um, except for people who don't, in which case they don't. I don't know about that one. This, some of these are getting a little weird. Littering, throwing garbage on the street, graffiti and tagging, uh, tagging or writing on the walls, and loitering, standing around doing nothing are against the law and punishable by fine or jail. Um, here's the thing about this one. Graffiti and tagging, painting on the wall, paint spray painting on the wall, you will you could potentially be arrested for that, right? Littering, there are technically fines for littering if you throw something, and if the police see you throw something, maybe they'll say, hey, pick that up. I've never seen anyone ever in my entire life get a fine for littering. Most people will just throw their stuff away in the garbage. And loitering, no way. Uh, loitering, just standing around doing nothing, no. That is not a, that's very misleading, absolutely. Discriminating against or making an, any insulting statement about someone else's religion or ethnicity is against the law and could be punishable as a hate crime. What? This is incorrect. Now, dis there are discrimination laws. For example, uh, hiring. You can't hire someone based on their religion or ethnicity. Like we only hire uh, Jewish people or we only hire, we only hire white people. <laughs> you, you can't do that, for example. However, we have something in the United States called freedom of speech. So these are totally different. There are discrimination laws taking actions against people based on ethnicity or religion or gender. But this is not. There is no such thing legally as a hate crime, as far as I can tell. Um, well, there's, yeah, I guess there is technically, well, there is technically, but the crime itself will be punished based on the law of the crime. So beating someone, for example, it doesn't matter what's going on in your head. It's illegal to, to do that. That's assault, right? But an insulting statement, you can say anything you want to anybody at any time. If you want to go up to Joe Biden, the president of the United States, and call him a big, stupid, old dingus with no brain and no bones. You can you can say that. You can say, I don't like you. You're an idiot. And that's fine, right? You can say horrible things. Legally, it's protected um, uh, in, in the United States. There are some things you can't do. For example, libel and slander, where you knowingly make up a lie to hurt someone in their reputation. That is illegal. And uh, also there's things like inciting violence to say, hey, go over there and attack that person. That is illegal too. But, but generally speaking, um, protected by the First Amendment. You, so I'm finding the first few of these. Yeah, oh, I agree. I agree. Nice. Great. Oh, fantastic. Correct. What? Huh? Mm -hmm. Crazy. Uh, not that, not that, of course, I don't, I'm not in favor of making insulting statements. I'm just saying it's not against the law. It's not against the law. I just did it. I just did that against Joe Biden. I just called him a big, dumb, fat, old turkey. He's not fat. 
a big, dumb, thin old turkey. There you go. Legally, I, I'm able to do that and say things like that whenever I want. Um, you must be over the age of 21 and have identification to buy alcohol. Correct. In most states, it is illegal to buy cigarettes if you're under the age of 18. Correct. And only smoke in certain places. Correct. Americans are extremely informal and call most people by their first name or nickname. First name, I think that generally that's correct. Um, yeah. Americans smile a lot and talk easily to strangers, sharing personal stories. I don't know. I haven't smiled since 2004, so I don't know about that. Asking how are you is simply a greeting and is not a question about your health. Yeah, that's true. How are you? I'm good. How about you? That's a good, that's a good, this is a good cultural point here. This is the first one that's actually very useful, I think, to understand if you know that when someone says, how are you? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to tell them a whole story. It's more like, hey, hey, what's up? Like that. Let's just do 25 of these. Just get a sense for this. And again, if you want to check out all of them, you can. But I'm not standing behind these all as true, uh, 100%. I'm working on my own course about American culture from my own point of view, of course. But I think it's a lot more accurate than this. When Americans put their hands on their hips, they are usually relaxed. When they fold their arms tightly across their chest, they're angry or very serious. Mm, I don't know if that's something you could generalize to the whole culture. That's a tricky one. I don't know where they're getting that. Americans don't push or stand too close to anyone in line. They always wait their turn. Yeah, generally that is true. Yeah. In a restaurant, the server is usually very friendly and helpful and often will tell you his or her name. Yes, but you have to give a tip. When the service is good, tipping is expected to be 15 to 20%. Yes, that is correct. 20% actually. If you go to a restaurant, the reason that the waiter and waitress are waiter or waitress is nice to you is that you should give them a tip. Polite Americans eat with one hand while the other one is under the table on their lap. I think that's becoming much, much less a norm. I don't think that's true anymore. Usually when friends meet at a restaurant, they each pay their share of the bill or split the bill in half. It's called going Dutch. Yes, that's true. We do that. Although it's not called going Dutch anymore. We just say, do you want to split the bill or let's split the bill? Last one. If you have guests over to your house, turn off the television. Make sure your music isn't too loud. Uh, well, I thought this was about... This is not a generalization. This is an instruction. What? Um, I don't know. These are getting weird. I'm finding some of them to be kind of inaccurate. These first seven are pretty good. And then with eight, it starts to get weird. I think it's still worth reading through them. Generally, the best way to understand culture is to watch movies and TV shows. And if you can, visit. Uh, have conversations with Americans and ask questions and see what works and what doesn't, right? As I mentioned, when I first went to China, I looked like an idiot all the time. And then I started to learn some things, some norms, some things that I should and shouldn't do. And uh, that improved how I looked in general in China. It's just a process of trying things out. But you can still learn this sort of thing going in, knowing that some things might be out of date, like putting your hand under the table on your lap. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. And some things maybe just generalized statements that is someone's opinion like this one sounds like to me but keep an open mind regardless be flexible and if you go to a country like the united states you've never been there before try to observe and be open to changing and doing as the romans do as they say Raphael 19 can 
easily be the other way around depending on the person. Let's see. 19 was uh, when Americans put. Yeah, exactly. Because you could put your hands on your. When I think of hands on your hips, I think sort of like that expression, hands on your hips. And then casually listening to a conversation, you could be like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that could be bored or that could be. I, I put my hands up. I cross my arms like this pretty often, I, th I think. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting. Ah, yes. What? And then I put my hands on my hips like that. Uh, Americans color inside the lines. I learned this idiom yesterday. Yeah, that means um, color inside the lines. I don't know why the text is gray like that. Can I change that? Generally, that means they follow the rules. They do what they're supposed to do. Um, yeah, I, I think generally that's true of most people in most cultures. People, people follow the norms of their of their culture, right? Generally speaking, generally speaking, generally speaking. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. I fixed it. Shabazz says, how can we improve our confidence during speaking English in front of people? You can't. It's impossible. No, just kidding. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. By the way, guys, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe or follow. That would be very helpful. Also, check out the courses in the links in the description. There's a one-hour course that you can take, which is free. So sign up for that and also building your english brain is on sale with the discount code what is the code i always forget brain food use the code brain food to get a discount on building your english brain which is a very popular course i believe it's one of the most popular english courses in the world. I have no way to back that up. That's just a claim. But I think it might be one of the top English courses in on the planet Earth. It's my opinion. I have reasons for thinking so. Uh, but I'm, I don't have access to all the data in the world to verify it. So it's just a claim that I'm throwing out there. Whether it's true or not. Shabazz says, how can we improve our confidence during speaking English in front of people? If you feel shy when you're speaking or not confident when you're speaking, the first question to ask yourself is, is it just for when I'm speaking English, my second or third language, or is it all the time? Now, I would say if it's the former, you that's great. You're in luck. If it's the latter, you have much more work to do. If you feel nervous all the time talking in front of people, even in your native language, then you have a general project of improving your confidence. And it's doable. People improve their confidence all the time. Generally, if you need to improve your confidence, you have to put yourself in situations that terrify you. Taking the step to go into a situation that you're afraid of and then being okay once you do that slowly builds up a sense of confidence. Even if you're speaking in your first language, maybe it's talking in meetings on Zoom or Teams or whatever, right? You feel nervous when you're explaining things. Do it more. If you have an opportunity to uh, take a, uh, a project on where you have to explain something every day, right? Or you need to be the one communicating between different groups. Put yourself into that situation. Whatever you're afraid of, do that more. And that sounds weird, but think about how you learn things. If you want to be better at climbing mountains, you have to climb more difficult mountains. And if it's easy, then you're not improving. So by avoiding situations, you avoid progress. 
by forcing yourself into situations, you force yourself to figure stuff out that you didn't think about before, and then you gain comfort and gain confidence. Now, it's also true when it comes to speaking English, but if you don't have a confidence issue in general, and it's just about speaking English, then it's very simple. Then you just have to put yourself into English speaking situations all the time. But I would recommend doing it in situations that are challenging for you. For example, if you have a small group of friends and you chat casually in English, that's not going to necessarily help your confidence issue, your English speaking confidence issue, because you feel very comfortable in that situation. So there you have to pick out specific English situations where you struggle and where you find you make more mistakes and you stumble over your words more or you mess up more, right? Find those, identify those, and then do those. Maybe that means joining an online book club where you have to discuss something complicated. Maybe that means in English giving a talk uh, or giving a speech at something like Toastmasters. You can sign up for uh, a, 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 a slot. You can sign up for that and practice giving, uh, giving a, a lecture or a, a speech. Uh, Toastmasters is speeches. You can sign up for, there's a, a something called Pitch Club you can sign up for. I believe that's on Facebook. I know the organizers of that. And you can practice explaining things there. You can practice using language there creatively. Whatever it is, jump into it, do it more, and pretty soon you'll find you feel comfortable. Then you'll have new challenges ahead of you, okay? So if you find, hey, I speak English a lot, but I'm, I still feel nervous in front of people, that means maybe you're speaking English a lot in the wrong situations. You have to speak English a lot in the situations that frighten you. And that is really the key. That is the only way to gain confidence in spoken English, as far as I know, as far as I've been able to see. Good question. Like it. Have confidence, dude. Yeah, exactly. And don't care what people think too much, you know. Eating with the hand under the table, I, th I may think the guy have a knife or a gun. Yeah, like the scene in, uh, there's a scene in Inglorious Bastards where they two guys are having a very tense conversation and they both have a gun under the table. And uh, there's a cultural thing that he didn't learn where he puts up this instead of this and he knows he's not a real German because he puts up this instead of this. He's a spy. And so they're having this very tense conversation. It's a great movie, Inglorious Bastards. And then they, they well, they shoot each other. Uh, you can sign up for Fight Club. Very true, yeah. Corinne says, please, do we say where, do we say where we are from? Where are you from? Or, or where are you from? Okay, good question. Corinne's question, please. Do we say, where are you from? Where are you come from? Or where are you from? Okay, so this would be, where are you from? Where are you from? Where do you come from? Where do you come from? So are from, do, you come from. And then if you say, where are you coming from? That's different. So let's explore these three. I think I could hop over to the board for a second. Shall I? I wasn't planning on doing that, but let's do that. Let's just explore these so we can see them, uh, kind of see them written down, right? Okay. Here we are on the blackboard doing the thing. Okay, so where are you from? Where do you come from? Where are 
you coming from and then are there any else any others um, I think those are the most common I guess you could say which country state city are you from okay now it's very important to, to understand that these are kind of contextual right so if i'm talking to someone who is clearly another american based on how they speak maybe i can assume it generally okay then if i say where are you from it's probably going to be about the state or maybe it'll be about the city. So people say, where are you from? And I know that this is another, a fellow American from the United States, for example, because of the context. I'll say Ohio, generally, I'm from Ohio. I won't say the United States. But if you're having an international conversation to travelers in a hostel or on a tour, and you say, where are you from? Then the answer is going to be country. Now, when you answer, you could say, I'm from, I'm from Ohio. I'm from France. You could, but if you want, you can just say country, you could just say state, Ohio, France. Okay. Now you have to know that the correct answer is France because of the context. If you say, if you say a region, this could also be region. I should say this could be a city state or region, right? Let's say, let's say Paris. Okay. So if you say Paris, that might be okay because everybody knows Paris. It's so universally known that if you say Paris instead of France, that's fine because I know that Paris is in France. And now I know not only which country you're from, but also which city you're from. So that's okay. But if I say Greenwich, you say, what? What do you mean? Because there's a Greenwich in England. There's a Greenwich village in New York. And there's a Greenwich Greenwich in tons of different states, Greenwich, Connecticut, so many different places around the United States. And where I come from, we call it Greenwich. And so if I just say that, you won't know what I mean. So the context dictates that if you are from my country, and I can tell that I'll say Ohio. And if you are from my state, I still might not say that town because it's so little known. I'll say, oh, it's a little town near another place because <laughs> you probably don't know it, even if you're from Ohio, right? Uh, so again, context. Where do you come from? This is more focused on origin right this uh this is sort of where you probably where you, where you live usually uh, or could be could be where you were born you can answer generally either one where do you come from is more formal sounding it generally has the same meaning and it is much it is much less common not very common and then where are you coming from means right now so you would only ask this question if this is a daily life situation. Where are you coming from? Oh, I just left the office. Where are you coming from? Oh, I, uh, I, I want to know your origin point and your direction, right? You're going home. You're coming from the gym. You're coming from work. You're coming from uh, driving from Idaho, right? Your point of origin, right? Not in your life where you were born, for example. Which, wow, why did I write a K there? Oops. Which country, state, city are you from is okay if you want to be very specific. But again, I think this is probably the best one. Where are you from? And I want to say one more, which I thought of just now, which is um, what is your hometown? I have seen in particular in China, this is a common question, what's your hometown? My hometown is 
hometown is where you were raised or your first the first place right where you spent the first few years of your life maybe where you were born this one i would not say because it's not really relevant this is much more common some people might be from one town or from one town where they spent a lot of their lives but maybe born and spent the first six months in another hometown which one is that it's not so clear and also this focuses on the town where we want we might want to know more about the state or the city or the country instead so you can never mean for example what's your hometown france no no what's your hometown paris that means you're born in paris okay maybe that's okay i would recommend this one above all the others because it is the most common so hopefully Corinne, that answers your question. And if not, let me know. You didn't understand the question at the airport customs. Ah, okay. Probably where are you from? And then you would say wherever you're from. Corinne, from? Oh, there they might say, where are you coming from at the airport? They might say, where are you coming from? That could be, though, your most recent destination. So let's say, yes, you're from France, but you went to the UK and then you uh, went to New York. So where are you coming from? The UK. That's not where you're from. That's where you're coming from. That was the most recent place where you were when you're answering the immigration questions. Yeah. In this movie, the fake German soldier was supposed to do the number three using the thumb index. And yes, that's right. If you watch Inglorious Bastards, apparently in Germany, when they show a three, it's like this. And in the UK, I think it's like this. For example, in the United States, it's like this. We say three like this. Some places it's like this. And or no. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's not this. It's this. Maybe he did this instead of this. He was supposed to show Thumb, index, and middle. I guess it would be like this. Yeah, I can't remember which one it was. Either this, this, or this. Or maybe he did this instead of this. I don't know. But it's a very tense scene, and it's extremely well-directed, and the dialogue is amazing. We can know the way of speaking or writing is beautiful or well-spoken in English. I tried to read English literature and poetry but i felt it's hard to grasp the aesthetic aspect of them um, okay all right well i want to do something that i think could be potentially interesting but i guess we'll see Let me see if this works. I want to play a, show you a little bit of, of, of a video game. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Does the sound work? Okay, we got sound, do we have sound? I wanna test the sound here and see if I can get that working. Um, here we go, influent. Sound, no, well, it's not, not playing the sound. Mm. Yeah, back to the video games, very important. Very important. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can sort my sound out because there is sound playing, but I'm not able to hear it on the speaker. So we can't do this unless we can hear the sound, right? Um, OK. 
Okay. Options. Is that working? Okay, let's try play. Where's the music? Can you guys hear the, um, can you guys hear the sound of the? Yes or no? Yes or no? Target language, English, of course. Hello? There we go. Okay, while this intro is playing, I'll see if I can get the sound working. Yeah, I know there's no sound. I'll see if I can sort it. Which we've got subtitles. World using state of the no sound guys i don't know if i'm able to sort the sound issue that sucks that's disappointing. I wanted to show this video. This Eng It's an English learning video game, and I wanted to try it. We might have to review it uh, in the future in that case because the sound is not playing. Steam games are weird like that. They're always weird with sounds. I always have issues when I play Steam games with playing the sound on the speakers. That's quite frustrating. I, they also have a phone version, which I might try to play in the future. Maybe the phone version will be better. Oh, well, we might have to come back to it. Rats. Rats, rats, rats. Let me try one more thing. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to give up on this particular thing. Um, how do I change the audio? There we go. Ecamm live audio. All right. Let's try this last thing. Secondary display. Nope. Nope. No bueno. Sorry, guys. No bueno. Well. Does it work on my headphones? Does it play on my headphones? Launching. Hmm. Nope. So this is what the game looks like, though. It's pretty cool. You walk around, and 
you click on things and it will define words and when you click on them it will give you uh, it will give you definitions you can add them to your list you can hear the sound um, it's pretty interactive it's pretty interesting it's the best one I've played so far there are a couple of different English language games but alas since there's no sound I'm calling it off too bad Maybe I'll get that sorted and do a separate video on that, um, just because I do want to. I do want to give it a try. Kind of want to review it. Um, Steam is so frustrating. I really hate using Steam. It's, it seems so clunky and so 1990s to me in some ways. Um, I just I'm not a I'm not a Steam fan. I am not a big Steam fan. Well, let's go to some. Reddit questions then. I want to check out a few questions from Reddit as I like to do occasionally just to just because there are some really good ones and you can kind of sort them because they're upvoted, right? Uh, so let's do that. Yeah, it is a very cute game. I believe it's a Japanese game and you can learn different languages with it. You walk around the house and you click on stuff and you can add things and there are challenges. It is very cute. Check it out. It is called Influent, I N F L U E N T, and I will do an I will do a separate review. I will do a review video, so look out for that. Um, okay, let's shall we hop over here? Let's see what we can find on Reddit English Learning. We're not going to do corrections for people, but we're going to talk about we're going to find some interesting questions that people have and see if we can answer them without looking at the answer first. Mm. Oh, this one I'm curious. Um, this one could be risky. Uh, you can download it if you have Steam. It's a Steam game and it's free. So yeah, you can download Steam on your PC. Then you can download the game and it's free. Also check out Stanley Parable. Stanley Parable is another talking game. It's not, I don't think that one's free. All right. Got any upvotes going on here? These are all under new, I think. So, oh, these are hot. Wow. Not very many um, upvotes on these. Okay. Help with your speech. Rolling the tongue to try to squeeze some English, eh? Sir, I want a job. How can I get? Um, yeah, well, I mean, you've got to find job opportunities, probably looking online, job hunting websites, and then uh, make sure you're prepared for the interview. If you want to check out my full interview course, you can do that. I have a course for people who are doing interviews. Uh, all the questions that they might ask you. Um, mate, pal, guys, not so interesting. I'm curious about this one. I'm watching this workout video and trying to decipher what the guy in it is saying. Some parts. Kind of to understand what he's saying. Okay. I feel like I should... Yeah, LinkedIn is a good place to start. But you might want to get a one month of LinkedIn premium in order to get all of the features that LinkedIn has right first. Um, I gotta, I gotta, this is very risky. I wanna, I have to watch this workout video before in case, you know, somebody's naked or something. All right, cool, I like this. How much are the course fees? Um, you can check out the courses in the link in the description and you'll find the prices all there. Pretty reasonably priced if you're making, making an investment in yourself. All right, so here we go. We've got a question on Reddit English Learning and the question is, 
help me understand what the guy in the video is saying. I'm watching this workout video and it's a it's a Google Drive video, which is a little sketchy, and trying to decipher what the guy is saying at some parts. Would anyone be kind enough to help me understand what he's saying at the following timestamps? So go to 1433 now and look for now hmm, just for a second. All right, let's see what he says. Here we go. 1433. Now keep in mind, I'm going to be giving you cues for those speeds such as walk, jog, run, and sprint. 14. For your gradient, you'll hear things like flat, hill, climb, and top. We're going to begin our warm-up in five. Now, laser focus, just for a second. Sprint. Yeah. I'm in the now, laser focus. Ah, well, that is a good question. That's a tough to hear. Now, that's a, just for a second, he's saying there, now, laser focus, I think, or laser focused. That means completely concentrate, be like a laser, focused. Be laser focused for a second. I'm going to say something important. Laser focus is uh, would be a sentence telling you what to do, right? And then laser focused is an adjective to describe how you should be. So I can't hear if it's laser focus or laser focused. But it's one of those two, I think. Should be. Okay, the other one, 1849. Mmm, the year I was born, 1849. All right, that one, let's go to that timestamp. 18, 1849. Here we go. And what's, uh, what's the cue? Uh... We have our jog mm -hmm, coming up. Okay. With a little pat on the back, open and close that chest. We have our jog for 60 coming up. Then we go. We have our jog for 60 coming up. We have our jog for 60 coming up. Root 60? Fruit 60? Something 60. Fruit, 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 fruit. <laughs> Root 60? I have no idea. Sorry, I can't understand that one. Root 60, Root 60 coming up. Uh, sorry, that's a tough one. Okay, and the last one is 2254. Twenty-two fifty-four. Okay. And the Q is blah 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 strong. I'm going big. Okay, here we go. Sprint for the whole session, yeah? Let's say this strong. Ah, I'm going that one's easy. Big. Let's end it strong. That's what he says there. Let's end it. That means this is the end of the workout. Let's finish with a strong sort of ending. Let's end it strong. Yeah. Let's end it strong. Let's end it strong. I like that one. Yeah, do. I'm curious if the subtitles can catch. Now we'll check the subs. Uh, can we turn subtitles on? Options. Uh, I don't think we're getting any subtitles. This is the biggest one. I'm gonna nope, nope, we're not getting any subtitles. All right, there you go, person, stranger from Reddit. I hope that helps. Sorry, I couldn't get 1849. I can't hear it. Something, something 60 sounds like fruit 60, <laughs> which makes zero sense whatsoever. All right, let's do one more of these. If you don't mind. Um, stick it to someone, meaning that's not bad. Maybe look at that one. That one I do like. Oscar, hello, welcome. Suman, welcome, glad to have you here. Awesome. Giving directions. 
first left or go down the hallway and take your first left. Make a first left. Yeah. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, nice. Ah, this is a good one. Ah. Okay. I don't know if this is a question. But here we have from Reddit. One of the most common English learner mistakes, how it looks like. I hear this so often from learners. I hear it from people whose English is really good otherwise. I hear it from people with a lot of education and great fluency. You must choose between how it looks and what it looks like. It is never correct to say how it looks like. That is right. And why is that? Because how it looks means what it looks like. How it looks is the way it looks. What it looks like technically is about comparing it to something else, right? So that could be a little bit different, but we would choose one or the other. Like is a comparison word. If you say it is like this, then I'm trying to think of that thing to understand what you're saying. It's like a combination of a banana and a mango. Okay, now I'm trying to picture what I know, which is a mango and a banana. If we're talking about the taste, now I'm trying to imagine what it would be like if I did that. Comparing, using like. What does it look like? What it looks like could be the same thing. It looks like a deer, but it has fire breath, right? So, okay, I can put those things together. I'm making comparisons. Now, you can use what it looks like to just give a description and to just say, well, it's got long fur, antlers, it breathes fire, and it has rollerblades. Okay, I can, I can, okay, nice description. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now I've got it, right? When, but we, we often will be using the comparison when we say that one. With the first one, how it looks, we're going to be less often making comparisons, like, it's like a mango plus a banana. And instead, we're just going to say, describe it. How it looks. How does it look? Tell me how it looks. I want to know how it looks. Okay, now we're not emphasizing the comparison. Now we're emphasizing just your ability to describe this to me. Okay, so it's like a wolf. Okay, I just did a description. <laughs> well, that could be part of my description. It's like a wolf, so that's okay to do. It has dark fur, skis for feet, a cinnamon roll as a tail, and they usually retire around the age of 34, 35. They often ski down snowy slopes and they enjoy backgammon. Okay, I don't know what that is that you're describing, but you gave me something to compare it to and you described a few things and I can put those together in my head. So while they are basically the same thing, the emphasis can be a little bit different. It's not that you're not allowed to make comparisons if you if you use this one, right? You can. I did. I wasn't trying to, but I did. And it's not that you're not allowed to just describe with this one and only say comparisons. You can do either one. But the emphasis is different. And this one is, in fact, never correct. Let's see what people are saying here. Yeah, that's a common mistake. If you're learning English and having trouble with this, uh, here's a good rule. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay. This is a good one. What it looks like? It looks like what? How it looks like? It looks like how? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's a good one. How does it look? How does it look would be correct. Yes. Let's see. Stick it to someone. I looked it up in dictionaries and they say to treat someone harshly, unfairly, or to retaliate. Demonstrate that you'll not be a pushover. So I guess to stick it to someone means to treat someone badly and prove that you have power over them. You stick it to them to show them that they are wrong, often in a revengeful way. You're wrong. I was right all along. Stick it to them. It's a negative feeling. It's a negative. Uh, you, you have 
no positive emotions in your heart when you stick it to them. It's like, ha ha, gotcha. You did something to me before and now I got you back. And for a moment, I'm the winner. Doesn't mean you generally have power over them, but just in that moment, you have turned the tables. You have done something that they they feel, now they feel stupid or something like that. Generally, that's how it's used. Yep. Um, all right. Well, sorry we didn't get to the English learning video game. I have sometimes sound issues. I need to get that sorted. I do apologize sincerely, deeply, truly. But I appreciate you all for joining today. I hope you enjoyed today's live English lesson. I certainly enjoyed it. If I didn't get to your question, I apologize. Feel free to join on Friday where I will be also answering questions. We'll be exploring more interesting things. If there are things specifically you want me to cover in these live lessons, please just let me know in the comments. Also, um, I'm going to be doing more one-to-one -one lessons live. So if you're interested in those, reach out to me. Uh, I'm kind of making a list of people who, who want to do those. Again, you have to be willing to do those live. What else? Yes, check out a free English course in the description. If you want, it's a one-hour course, very useful, short and sweet, but impactful. Also, Building Your English Brain, my most popular course, is on sale. If you click on the link in the chat, you can get that discount price. Check that out. What else? Anything else? Ah, I would appreciate if you could hit the like button and subscribe. That would be most appreciated. And again, if I didn't get to your question, I will uh, I will do my very best to answer it on Friday. We do these on Wednesdays and Fridays around 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or GMT 5 p.m., I believe. Is that right? Maybe GMT 5. Is that, is that someone? Ch Fact check me on that. I think that's right. Um, uh, GMT 5 p.m. I'll just say it. Something like that. Because it's always around anyway. Anyway, 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 anyway. Thanks for joining. Take care. Have a great Wednesday. Have a great rest of the week. And I hope to see you on 